Suppose that R is a commutative ring with unity and let el the elements R and S belong to this ring R. Uh, then we say that D, also an element of R, is a common divisor of R and S if, of course, D divides R and D divides S. So it's a common divisor if D is a divisor of R and divisor of S. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, the next one, what does it mean to be a greatest common divisor? Uh, so D is the greatest common divisor of R and S if D prime is some if D prime is some other common divisor of R and S, then D prime also divides D. So you're the greatest common divisor of every common divisor of D and S divides into you. And so we then denote the greatest common divisor of D as GCD of RS. Now I should mention that um, the greatest common divisor is only unique up to association. Uh, because after all, if you have, uh, if you have, if you have D as a common divisor, the greatest common divisor of R and S, and you take some associate of that, so like D prime, well, in that situation, D prime will divide D, and you'll have that D divides D prime. And since transit, uh, since divisibility is transitive, anything that divides D will also divide D prime, and everything divide D prime will divide D. So if so when we talk about greater common divisors, we're really talking about it up to association. Now, you typically, uh, you, you know, you've probably talked about common divisors and greatest common divisors in the in the rational domain, that is the ring of integers, um, in which case you, you typically talk about um, positive numbers in that sense. So when we talk about, for example, here's the number 12, here's the number 16, we say that the GCD of 12 and 16 we often say that's four. We really mean that's four is the association class. Um, you could also say negative four uh, because as a divisor that works the same way as well. Now, when people first learn about greatest common divisors, they often think of the wrong ordering. Uh, they might think it's greatest in the sense that, oh, you know, two is a common divisor, four is a common divisor of 12 and 16, but four is bigger than two. We're not talking about the ordering of the real numbers. We're talking about divisibility, right? Four is the biggest because it, um, because every other divisor divides it. Every other common divisor, like one and two, for example, divide four. Um, and that's why four and negative four are actually both considered GCDs. But for, for integers, of course, we typically choose the positive representation. And as we look at other domains where positive and negative doesn't quite make much sense anymore, like in the Gaussian integer ring, uh, we still often choose sort of canonical uh, representatives if it matters. But be aware that... Um, be aware that the GCD is unique up to association. So we say that two elements are relatively prime. So R and S are relatively prime, are called co-prime, if their GCD is equal to one. And of course, when I say the GCD is equal to one, I mean their GCD, um, their GCD is, well, the GCD is the class, right? Because it's again up to association. Now, who is an associate of the number one? That's any unit. Any unit is an associate of one. So if the GCD is a unit, that means you're co-prime. And typically we represent that using one. Now, similar to common divisors, we can talk about common multiples. So we say a number M inside the ring is a common multiple of R and S if R divides M and S divides M. Notice the difference there. The common divisor divides both numbers, but the common multiple is divided by, it's divisible by both of those numbers. And similarly, we can define the notion of a least common multiple. The least common multiple means if you have any multiple M prime, then the least common multiple will divide that one as well. So it's smallest in the relationship of divisibility. And likewise, we will denote the least common multiple as LCM of R and S. This is unique up to association. Um, different associates are still, are still LCMs. And again, like with integers, we typically choose this to be a positive number, but that's not required in other rings where that might not make a lot of sense. So I want to show you an example of where, how do we put it? Um, GCDs don't necessarily exist right? Uh, we, we're so used to the integer ring that we might not realize that in other integral domains, you might not have unique fact, well, you might not have unique factorization, but you also might not have LCMs, you might not have GCDs. And so I actually want to come to this example right here of Z adjoined the square root of negative three. We played around with this example before and showed that this was an example of an integral domain that's not a unique factorization domain. And we also showed that in this ring, we have irreducible elements that are not primes. 
in an integral domain, primes are always irreducible, but you can have it be true that an irreducible is not prime. We found an example of that here. Um, but of course, in a unique factorization domain, primes and irreducibles are the same things. So in a unique factorization domain, basically factorization works the way you expect it to, like it does with the integers. If you don't have unique factorization, weird things can happen, like irreducibles aren't prime. In this, in this non-UFD, we'll also see that you might not have GCDs. And if you don't have GCDs, you also might not have LCMs as well. Um, so their existence is also a property of, U, of UFDs, which we'll talk about in just a second. So consider the following. Um, the number 2 divides 4, and the number 1 plus the square root of negative 3 also divides 4. We've talked about this previously. 4, of course, factors as 2 times 2. It also factors as 1 plus the square root of negative 3 times 1 minus the square root of negative 3. This was the example we used earlier to show that this ring does not have unique factorization because these are different irreducible factorizations of the same number 4. Okay, so I want to point out here then that 2 and 1 plus square root of negative 3, these are both divisors of 4. But I also want you to consider the number 2 plus 2 times the square root of negative 3. 2 divides that. Well, that one's pretty easy to see because you can factor out the 2. So you get 2 times 1 plus the square root of negative 3. But uh, by doing so, it also makes it obvious that 1 plus the square root of negative 3 also divides that. So notice what's happening here. Um, 2 divides 4, 2 divides 2 plus 2 times the square root of negative 3, so 2 is a common divisor. But likewise, 1 plus the square root of negative 3, it divides 4, and 1 plus the square root of negative 3 divides 2 plus 2 root negative 3. So these are two common divisors of 4 and 2 plus 2 root negative 3. Okay, like we argued in a previous video, but we can make the argument right here again, 2 doesn't divide 1 plus root negative 3, nor does 1 plus root negative 3 divide 2. They're not associates of each other. The associates of 2 are plus or minus 2, and the associates of 1 plus root 3, negative 3, are 1, 1 or minus 1 plus root negative 3. Because in this ring, the only units are plus or minus 1. So they're not associates of each other. And I should also mention that these numbers have a norm of 4, right? If we take the norm of 2, this equals 2 squared plus 3 times 0 squared. This is equal to 4. Now, on the other hand, if you take the norm of 1 plus the square root of negative 3, you're going to end up with 1 squared plus 3 times 1 squared, which is, of course, 1 plus 3, which is likewise 4. So they can't divide each other without being associates because norms factor, um, and they have the exact same norm. So they only divide each other if and only if they are associates, but they're not associates of each other. Okay, so if there was a greatest common divisor, pretend there is one for a moment, call it D, then the greatest common divisor of 4 and 2 plus 2 root negative 3, it's going to be a number of the form A plus B root negative 3 because everything in our ring looks like that. Um, but it can't be 2 and it can't be 1 plus the square root of negative 3. But when we look at the norms, this is important to consider the following. It's also true that the greatest common divisor is not 4. It's also not 2 plus 2 root negative 3, okay? Uh, because... If the GCD was equal to 4, that means 4 would divide 2 plus root uh, square root of negative 3 there, which we have the same problem again, right? The norm of 4 in this situation is going to be 16. Um, but likewise, the norm of 2 plus 2 root negative 3 in this situation, you're going to end up with 2 squared plus 3 times 2 squared. Uh, so you end up with 4 plus 12, which is equal to 16. Again, these same numbers... 4 and 2 plus root negative 3, they have the same norm. So the only way that 4 divides 2 plus 2 root negative 3 is if they're associates. But the associates of 4 are plus or minus 4. Same thing going on with this direction. So they don't divide each other. So the greatest common divisor of 4 and 2 plus root uh, square root of negative 3 has to be something smaller. But at the same time, it has to be the biggest one. So uh, what we see here is the GCD is divisible by 2. It's divisible by excuse me, 1 plus root negative 3, but it also divides 4, and it divides 2 plus 2 root negative 3. The norm of 2 and the norm of this number were 4. The norm of these ones are 16, so it's got to sit somewhere in the middle. So in particular, the GCD, if it existed, would have to be a number whose norm is equal to 8. 8 is the only divisor of 16 that's divisible by 4 that's not 4 or 16. 
right? Uh, so we have to have that the norm of D is equal to eight. Um, so suppose, suppose that such a number exists, then that would have to be a number. There has to be a number uh, in our in our ring, so this is something of the form, you know, c plus d times square root of negative three. We'll call it e for a moment. There has to be some number so that d times e is equal to four, because after all, we need that d divides four, right? If we take the norm of that, we're then going to get the norm of the norm of d times the norm of e is equal to sixteen. Since the norm of a, the norm of d is equal to eight, that means the norm of e is equal to two. And like we talked about before, there is no way that the norm of such a number could be two because the norm always looks like a squared plus three b squared, and there is no integer choice for a and b that force that allows this to equal two. So this is then proof that we don't have a GCD between four and two plus two times. Uh, the square root of negative three, which is a very curious thing. GCDs might not exist in a general domain, uh, much like irreducibles are not necessarily primes in a general domain. The two things are actually quite related to each other because I want to then just make a quick argument here that in a UFD, GCDs exist. And likewise, LCMs exist. You can cook up a similar example, um, like in this ring here, four and two plus two root negative three. They don't have a least common multiple by basically the exact same problem here. But in a unique factorization domain, GCDs exist. And why do they exist? It's the same reason, uh, it's the same algorithm, I should say, that you learned in primary school. So like if you're trying to find, hmm, what's the GCD between, let's say, 12 and 18, well, the idea is look at the unique factorizations. Look at the prime factorizations. 12 factors as 2 squared times 3. 18 factors as um, 2 times 3 squared. You look at all the common primes, so 2 and 3 are both in common. Then you pick the smallest power. The GCD uh, is going to then have to equal 2 to the first times 3 to the first. Um, so 12 can only offer 1, 3 and 18 can only offer one, two. So the GCD is gonna be six. You can derive it from the unique factorization, the prime factorization, I should say. And so this algorithm works in any UFD because we have prime factorizations. Given, given the GCD between any two numbers that are not zero and not a unit, because those ones are exceptional, um, a unit divides everything. So if one of these is a unit, then the GCD is just the other number. Zero, of course, is weird because everything divides zero. All right. Uh, so, but if you have two numbers which are not units and not zero inside of your ring, then that has a unique, it has a prime factorization, it has a prime factorization. So the GCD is going to be select all the common primes and then choose the smallest exponent amongst all of them. By similar reasoning, LCMs also exist because you're going to look at all the primes and look at the maximum um, power of each of the primes. And you can build them from that algorithm we learned back in primary school, which is pretty cool. And so, that's going to end lecture 16, where we've talked about, of course, unique factorization domains, and we've talked about factorizations and integral domains in general, right? If you want to talk about factorizations in an integral domain, a UFD is the place to be. Primes and irreducibles are the same things. We have prime factorizations. We have GCDs. We have LCMs. Um, if you're in a domain but not a UFD, some of those things might fall apart, like, of course, in this ring, uh, Z times the square root of negative three. And we'll explore many of these ideas, of course, in the future. Thanks for watching. If you learned anything about factorization and ring theory, like this video, like the other videos in lecture 16 as well. Uh, post in the comments if you have any questions that weren't answered. Um, and please subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future. Thanks, everyone.